Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small medium sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a research engineer, a financial analyst, and a financial journalist. Tonight, I'd like to speak to you about the disturbing trends that are developing in the world today. Those of us, those of us who follow the news closely are in danger of simply watching scandal and outrage until we become paralyzed into doing nothing else politically, complaining as we watch a tidal wave of injustice break over our worlds. What can we as individuals do to move the world in a better direction? I find two statements constantly used. Be the change that you seek. The idea that we must first become fully enlightened saints before any justice or redress of the injustice can be obtained. It is important that we find empathy in our hearts patience and nonviolence, even as we scrutinize these outrages that are occurring daily against the people and the natural systems of the earth, uh, as we become more and more frustrated and upset. I do believe that the powerful interests who have become stronger and stronger in recent times are still humans that can be reasoned with. Their points of view may be extremely frustrating to try to reshape, but I'm not yet at the point where I've given up at all. Just as the powerful have fragmented and harassed the movements that have sought to confront them, they too are vulnerable to division. The ruling class can be split through mass movements and persuasive argument. The statement, be the change that you seek, has the danger of delaying action until vast amounts of damage are done. I would answer that making changes in the world transforms a person, that to be in a, a revolutionary in times of great injustice is to be spiritually alive and that any other choice is collusion, basically evil, and makes this uh, internal spiritual transformation a moot point and even irrelevant. <laughs> so we have to balance action with personal character development. The second statement I hear constantly is, what can I do? I'm only one person. The sentiment in the United States is one of total personal powerlessness. I asked my father, for example, a former left-leaning history professor, what one of my family members who said this, what can I do line to me, what she should do. He suggested she should donate money to an abused animals fund. From my point of view, this would be the worst possible distraction. And it's incredible that a left-leaning history professor also has effectively admitted that we are powerless. Well, apparently so. So these two questions to me are vital. <clears throat> the statements I'm about to make are not loosely researched opinion. They are indisputable double referenced facts. I've tried very hard not to make any journalistic mistakes. And when I've done so, I've updated the note sections to reflect any errors. I am deeply concerned that the majority of people in the world are not aware of these events. We, those of us who do study the news carefully, especially the alternative media, Look in horror at the snowballing concentration of power and wealth. For example, in the Chronicle today, there was an article about negative inflation. That is to say that savers are actually having their deposits shrink. A one-year T-bill currently yields 0.12% interest as they exclaim, experience the miracle of compounding annual interest. Um, it's also interesting to note that this is irrelevant for the bottom 40% of the people because they have $3,000 or less in cash. 40% of the older people have no money. 20% live entirely, 50% uh, on their investments. Uh, so it's not relevant for them either because they're in stocks. So uh, it's quite an interesting situation where savings are obsolete. And of course, this is where the U.S. Uh, steals from its people every year by debasing the currency by printing a trillion dollars in new money every year just for the federal debt alone. What are the powerful interests that control our society? Briefly, the mainstream media is no longer engaged in anything resembling what journalism should be. Fox News and MSNBC, while actually having very similar ownership and interests, appear to be different, and in some respects are. But more and more, they share a common worldview. One openly favors the wealthy, supporting massive government, but only in intelligence and defense of police, guardians of the wealthy class's power. The other, MSNBC, advocates a robust state, both in military and police powers, but also in using a government to advance social policy, government which is largely captive to major corporate interests. 
Six large companies control the majority of the Western world's wealth. Um, the two largest of which are State Street and BlackRock. State Street claims that they have um, two trillion in assets under management and twenty trillion uh, in another category, which I will not distract from at this moment. The CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, was the number one person who Tim Geithner of the U.S. Treasury spoke to in his first term of the Obama administration. BlackRock is even bigger than State Street. And these companies are very publicity adverse. If you Google political uh, uh, sentiments of State Street, you will find nothing. If you even go to Wikipedia and look for the CEO of the second uh, uh, largest controller of cash in the world, you will find no Wikipedia article, although I do intend to remedy that. These country companies are seldom mentioned in the media, and they control the majority of the stock in nearly every Fortune 500 company. They're asset managers. They are holding this money in trust for clients, yet they get to decide what companies to buy and sell from in many cases. If they did a selling of their holdings, they could tank nearly any major company stock. The regulation of both telecommunications and media has been dismantled, permitting massive and disturbing concentration. The combination of the military-industrial complex with certain religious conservatives, certain neoconservative Monarchian types, evangelicals, quasi-fascist supporters of ultra-right policies in the Catholic Church, such as Opus Dei, these forces aligning with the media and financial sector heavenly, heavily dominated by uh, Jewish Americans who I have no hostility towards but have a deep uh, need to preserve the state of Israel uh, which is currently embarked on a foolish policy of uh, undermining any basis for a two-state solution creates an interlocking set of interests of these neoconservatives, the military-industrial complex of the media turning the system into a media military industrial complex. And the public humiliation of Chuck Hagel certainly evidenced this, this new media military industrial complex, which may be uh, more important than the White House itself, since they essentially control whose face gets on television. And one of the root problems that exacerbates this, the financial sector's interest in this media military industrial complex is invasion capitalism, destroying and then rebuilding companies, countries, opening up foreign countries to U.S. business, which is an understandable goal of the State Department. Uh, it, it has become an extremely vile and sinister methodology used when accompanied by what was used to be called gunboat diploma, diplomacy which I find calmly and openly called for in respectable newspapers, television stations, and magazines. The financial companies themselves have committed horrific crimes involving trillions of dollars. The government will not prosecute them, perhaps because the government is captive to their interests. HSBC and the LIBOR scandals would be a good place to start if you're interested in researching these matters. Matt Taibbi is a man to follow in these matters, just as Glenn Greenwald holds Obama's feet to the fire on civil liberties and censorship. Our private communications are collected at a rate of a million of one and a half billion communications a day. We pay as much for defense and surveillance as, as all other domestic programs combined at the federal level, not counting what are called entitlements, that is, Medicare and Social Security, while simultaneously having a world that is by and large peaceful in terms of the specter of a large-scale conventional conflict. We spend at least $100 million a year for each supposed 9-11 victim we might prevent with a $2 trillion security uh, state expenditure out of a $16 trillion economy. Money which, in effect, causes 4,000 deaths by not being spent in truly productive areas. We have uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of preventable deaths. The, the best way to die is to go to a hospital. There are 150,000 deaths a year from uh, murdering people in hospitals through the wrong medications being delivered, the wrong limbs being removed. Obesity, heart disease, all these things can't be funded. Uh, and poverty, the root condition of it, cannot be eradicated when we are siphoning off $2 trillion a year into a military-industrial complex. 
the worst possible place to invest in for jobs, yet every congressman runs off to his district uh, to protect the military bases in a district. Why can he not uh, advocate the money be used to create real wealth producing jobs? So we're in effect killing with this $2 trillion misallocation of funds a million people a year uh, while pr supposedly saving a few hundred lives from some theoretical terrorist acts. Whereas in fact our policies would actually create more people who hate us. They may not be able to strike us at the moment, but we cannot keep this up forever. We cannot become a prisoner of our own bad policies. <clears throat> Additionally, the massive security state makes us le less safe and leads to a fearful, cowed citizenry. Those of us who report on these things do live in fear. Fear for acting morally, because it is immoral to stay silent when you see these things happening. Bradley Manning, Julian Assange, and those few people in the government still willing and able to try to expose daylight on these matters, the whistleblowers, all are aware of the fear. In fact, in Dante's Inferno, there is a special level of hell dedicated specifically to those who stand by and do nothing. If I feel the pressure of self-censorship, worrying about the effects on my job from political activism, imagine how much more so do those in positions that are truly in this public spotlight. Is it not interesting that the one effective critic of unbridled power and finance, the Attorney General of the State of New York, Elliot Spitzer, was taken down to his sexual pecadillos. Sex crime is one very good way to destroy anyone who resists the corruption in the system. The Obama administration has taken the imperial presidency of Bush to a new level, with Greenwald, Taibbi, and others calling Obama Bush on steroids. Our country has been engaging recently in war crimes of a horrific nature in the name of spreading our values. We currently have an archipelago of military bases being built from here to Colombia, the whole area that we have inflamed in our war on terror rather than treating drugs as a medical issue. The rest of South America has broken away from us, and we have very little influence there. The whole policy is ham-fisted, an area uh, in flames and bleeding and in pain from Mexico to Colombia, the rest of the continent prospering, broken away from U.S. influence, with the exception of Chile. <clears throat> We've engaged in war crimes of a horrific nature all over the world recently, spreading our so-called values. Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, Mali, Iraq, Syria are all places where mass death, looting of the country's assets, destruction of its archaeology, archaeological heritage, the most heinous forms of torture imaginable, which uh, there is an excellent piece on uh, that the BBC just broke, called In Search of Colonel James Steele, which will make your blood run cold. Uh, it's also on Friday's episode of uh, Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. All of this could not have happened without us. The Petro Monarchies, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia in particular, have been collaborating with us in many of these sordid affairs. The Obama administration has complained of Qatari. Qatari arming of Libyan religious extremists and Syrian religious extremists. But these cries rung hollow when one considers that the largest arms sales in the history of the world occurred under the Obama administration to Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Add to this the national security laws, whose very interpretations are secret, and a public who has denied access to this information through their media, who has utterly failed to inform them on the majority of these matters, perpetuating a thought monoculture coming from the Washington bubble. These national security laws run roughshod over the Bill of Rights, while our constitutional law professor, President Obama, presides over one of the most serious assaults on the Bill of Rights in the history of our republic. I have witnessed the assault on my children's minds in a seriously broken public education system. In fact, I would have been better off just teaching them a few hours a day at home. Uh, they're too busy, though, to actually learn, uh, sitting in classes, being distracted, disciplined, uh, taught at whatever random level the other kids are capable of functioning at. Our higher education system has turned uh, into a, a, a system that seeks profit and power, betraying its clients, the students. Our electoral system has become a joke, a two-party state, is, which is a structural flaw in our country for a long time, has become little better than a one-party state. The computerization of voting machines has been done completely incorrectly. It's a subject of major scandal. Just search for the word Diebold and Greg Palast if you're curious about it. And thus far, it's only been used to tip elections, such as in Ohio, in the Kerry Bush race. That is, to steal close races. In uh, Florida, they stole the race by 
um, accusing uh, black people of not being uh, uh, permitted to vote because they had criminal records and mass delisting them when in fact the, the, this was not the case. It is shocking that such a large nation cannot even issue an audit trail for its voting systems. Our system wouldn't even certify the very observers that we sent overseas in some cases. It would be far better to simply have open ballots than secret ballots, which is so secret that we ourselves don't know whether they were counted or who that they were counted for. The Republican Party has now begun to institute rules that are popular in totalitarian parties, such as the Bolsheviks and the Nazis, a top-down system of electing the local rank and file. After the embarrassment of the Ron Paul candidacy, the local leadership is now to be selected by national committee. This is an oversimplification, but if you research this, it is a black mark of shame on the Republican Party. So what are the solutions? Well, for our current macro system, the United States of America, I seriously think we have to have a constitutional amendment to add a third legislative body similar to the House and the Senate that's based on a national popular vote, it's not regionalized, wherein fractional candidates and parties are represented. A multi-party democracy. There are very few in Congress that vote against the attack on constitutional liberties. The attack on the internet through both Defense Department and SACA type maneuvers and intellectual property laws. The vote against war. The be willing to cut, cut off funding to Israel. She does not allow the Palestinians the right to vote. It's an unbelievable state of affairs that we are funding a country that uh, has a set of people living in it that are not allowed to vote. Those few who do are targeted for removal. With an unbelievable near 90% re-election rate, those who stand up for these principles are defeated through being targeted. Dennis Kucinich is one. Pete Stark is another. Uh, Pete Stark was a local Bay Area representative who was uh, driven out of office effectively by the local newspapers. And it wasn't until after he left office that I found out that he was somebody who voted consistently, very courageously, even if he was an old curmudgeon. If you research the handful of Congress people who stand up for peace and liberty, liberty, you'll see they're all targeted and taken out one by one. Alan Grayson, Dennis Kucinich, Pete Stark. I haven't studied the Republicans who've been targeted, but I assume the same is on their side. So it's time, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, to turn our eyes to the solution. This will be my last broadcast in principle which focuses on the perfidy of the ruling classes of the Western world. I will no longer spend my time while I'm studying the state of the world, tallying their sins and watching them in horror and reporting on it. God willing, they will watch us as we build better systems, better institutions, and better organizations to obsolete, crony, globalist, supercapitalism. I do commit to being the change that I seek, and I ask you to do the same, and to help provide an answer to the abdication of personal responsibility to change the system that I hear all around me. What can I do about it? And be the change that you seek. These are the two statements. Don't buy, well, so here are some of the action items for this night's broadcast. Don't buy anything from any large business that you can get from a small business. Boycott every company with bad policies. Use the boycott power extensively. Use private doctors that do not work for chains if possible. Every penny you spend should go directly to the producer. And the producer should be a small business or an incredibly enlightened large business. Donate to and support alternative serious fact-based media. Don't buy telecommunication service from media giants. Don't buy media services from telecommunication giants. Watch alternative outlets that oppose the crony capitalist policies of the United States and the West. Watch the U.S. business-dominated media if you want to see the dark side of Iran or Putin. But watch Iran's press TV and Russia Today to see a critique of our uh, corporate interests. These are examples. Don't give money to the Republican or Democratic parties, except in close elections uh, that are swing in your swing districts that you're living in. Vote exclusively for third parties. Organize cooperatives, alternative education and medicine structures, locally owned energy. Start small businesses. Don't pay taxes. Put considerable effort into legal tax strategies that starve the government of your cash. Don't subsidize invasion capitalism, totalitarian brainwashing masquerading as education, the surveillance state, or the war on drugs. Go into business and hire people. 
New business with countries with good policies. At the moment, the first tier is Bolivia, Iceland, Ecuador, Uruguay, to name a few quickly. The second tier could be Algeria, Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, countries that fight the enrichment of an elite and are not beholden to the central bankers. Here, then, is a draft declaration of independence from the ruling class and uh, crony globalized super capitalists. We shall build an economy that produces real value, not busy work. Three quarters of the job in this country today produce nothing. Imagine if we took all those people and had them actually producing things of real wealth, such as scientists, artisans, artists, manufacturers, craftsmen, builders, healers, farmers, not speculators, soldiers, bureaucrats, and spies. Therefore, the first point of the declaration should be, in my opinion, that we build an economy that has real wealth as its basis, not busy work and military Keynesianism. We shall build a political structure where no one will ever again have to say, what can I do about it? We shall build a political economy where every person is unalienated. An alienated person is somebody who feels powerless, either economically, because they have no guarantee they'll have their job from one day to the next or politically, that they have no sense that their vote actually makes a real difference. And we shall declare that you shall not be taxed on necessities of any kind, not on your primary dwelling, and that each person should have equity in their uh, food production system, their farming resources, the land, the water, the air, natural resources to supply their water and power needs, their housing, their medical care, their educational care, in a manner that cannot put them at the whim of any other person or organization. In developing these solutions, in searching for them, we will improve and influence current systems as well, whether intentionally or unintentionally. I read a very good book that was written in the early 80s or late 70s by Kirkpatrick Sales called Human Scale, which I suggest that you obtain. I also suggest you look at the book Economics in One Lesson, which is part of the Austrian Economist School. You may not agree with them, but they also agree with one important point, which is that when you break a window, you're not actually creating production. And this is the key, both on the left and the right, that we do not build an economy around fluid hydraulics. We build an economy around real wealth production. Otherwise, we shouldn't get up and do anything. We should enjoy ourselves. We shouldn't be busy just for the sake of busyness. It's a form of purgatory or hell. We need in the utility industries to obtain equity ownership in, uh, not in opt-in structures, not totalitarian government mandatory structures. It is my view that we need to essentially split the economy in three parts. Traditionally, we talk call these the primary, secondary, and tertiary components of the economy. The primary was mining and farming. The secondary would have been manufacturing, industry, and the tertiary would be services. In my view, the three structures of the economy we have to look at are the utility industries, those things we need to exist to, uh, and if imagine if you could have essentially something like an investment in a company that did health care, an investment company that did education and housing and the basic utilities where your dividend was lifelong access to those services. That's essentially a capitalist way of viewing how to de-alienate everyone so that they can't be turned out of their houses or lose access to any of these things or be forced to accept mediocre education or toxic food. So the bottom is the utility industry, the necessity economy. And that should be organized uh, in, in many, many different ways. But everyone should have 100% ownership and there should be no taxes whatsoever. People should be able to entirely stop working if we automate and finish all the work. Get it done. Build the bridges, build the robots, and it's done. I mean, don't jobs eventually have an end? <clears throat> so these utility industries are housing, education, medicine, food, clothing, and power. Then the second are quasi-necessity economies, things people need to be happy, um, transport, tools and computers. Then the, the tertiary aspect of the economy, that is a part that remains capitalist um, entirely, uh, which is um, luxury industries. That's as far as I've thought these components of it out. My name is Alexander Hagen. Thank you for listening. Good night and good luck.